Right, welcome everyone, let's start. So this talk is called Breaking Black Box AI. Uh, so first, let me introduce myself. I am Evelina Gabashova. I work as a research data scientist uh, in the British National Institute for Data Science and AI. Uh, so forgive me, there will be mathematics and things like that because we are a research institute. But it's not a research talk anyway. Uh, surprisingly, my most academically cited work is uh, the work I did with the Star Wars social network, where I looked at screenplays and extracted social networks of characters of Star Wars. And that's my academically most cited work, so that's how I enter the history. Uh, right now I'm working on various things like reinforcement learning for air traffic control. So if you came from overseas to this conference, don't be scared, there's nothing in production, this is all research. Uh, I want to talk about how we do machine learning right now in practice. Like if you are working in a company and do machine learning or AI and want to be cool, what do you have to do? Well, not much, because we have all of these libraries and if you just want to run a neural network, you just create a neural network. If you want to run a random forest, you just create a random forest because we have scikit-learn, we have all sorts of libraries in R, we have PyTorch, we have TensorFlow, we have Keras. It's easy and most of the fancy machine learning algorithms amount to basically just a one-liner. And if you don't even want to do that, you can just call some machine learning APIs like uh, Microsoft has cognitive services, uh, there's Amazon machine learning, there's Google prediction API. So you don't have to even install anything even vaguely mathematical. So the conclusion is that right now you don't need any mathematics. On the right, there is a page from a random book that I took uh, from behind me in my office. Uh, and this is what you needed to do if you wanted to do machine learning 10 years ago. But now, you literally just call a function. You don't need to understand that at all, which I think is great. But there are small caveats. Uh, I think that uh, I like to use the metaphor of a compiler, where if you are doing machine learning, you just call a function, it does the magic for you. If you are programming, you don't need to understand how a compiler works uh, and behind the scenes. You don't need to do all the lexing and tokenizing and parsing and constructing ASTs, etc., Because it's all done behind the scenes and you don't have to care. You don't really have to understand it at all. It's nice if you do, but you don't really have to at all. Uh, machine learning is trying to get to the same stage, but unfortunately it's not there yet. And the problem is that with the software development and machine learning, they are fairly similar. You can get implementation bugs, uh, like things that don't work can be very similar. You use algorithms in both. But with machine learning, it's still the case that it can fail silently. So you can get completely wrong results without actually noticing, without no one noticing. So that's what I want to look at today. Uh, so I called it black box machine learning. Uh, because a lot of people just don't really want to understand the mathematics behind it, or even if they do, they don't really want to care that much. They just want to run an algorithm. So it's basically using it as a black box, just a function that you call with some input data, some input parameters, some outputs, and you are set to go. You can put it into production. So the rules for today's talk will be I'm going to use algorithms from popular libraries with minimal setup because who reads uh, documentation? Uh, I will try to keep mathematics at a minimum and just observe when things go wrong. So let's start with the basic, the most basic thing in machine learning, uh, linear regression. Quite a lot of people would disagree that linear regression is not AI, it's not machine learning. I think it just depends if you want to earn money from it or not. So, and I want to make this as practical as possible. So I won't 
don't want to keep anything a secret, I'll be doing this from a Jupyter notebook. You can see this is a normal Jupyter notebook with a presentation plugin. So you can then go and run it yourself and play with it yourself as well. Uh, so for the first demo, I'll be using R, because for R, linear regression is basically the hello world of R. Because R, I don't think it's a proper programming language, it's more sort of a DSL for doing data science and statistics. So let's use it to do some linear regression. Here I'm just loading a library. And if you have never seen R, uh, this is how it looks. You use, uh, well, you can use equal sign, but you traditionally use arrows to assign values, etc. And this creates a data set uh, called a data frame. Uh, and this data set is not interesting because it's just generating random values from a normal distribution with zero mean unit variance. This part is as mathematical as it goes. So uh, this is my y, y value, this is my x value, and this is just literally random noise. Nothing more, nothing less. What happens if we run linear regression on this model? Well, this is how you do linear regression in R. You create a LM function, linear model, where y depends on x. So this is my y variable, this is my x variable, and I'm trying to compute the values of a and b, and I'm trying to predict the values of y given x. You might remember that both of these are just random noise variables, so it shouldn't do anything reasonable, hopefully. So I'll run the model, and because R is a very traditional language for doing statistics, this is the sort of output you get. Uh, I want to concentrate on two values. One is the p-value, which is important if you are doing any kind of academic research and want to publish it. Now, basically, the lower, the better. Uh, and the p-value tells you how likely you are get, uh, uh, getting this result by chance. So in this case, it's about 11%, so that's quite a high chance this is just a random noise thing. The second thing I want to look at is the R squared value here, which is 2.5, roughly. And that's the percentage of variance of Y that I can explain with X. So I can explain about 2.5% of the variance of Y from X. Makes sense, it's still random noise. But what happens if I add one data point that will be completely outside of my data range? So these are the original data that I was showing, the random noise concentrated around zero, and I added one outlier. People who have ever used linear regression and know how it works are probably sort of know what's going to happen. So let's run exactly the same model now, and let's look at the two values I was showing you before. So now my R squared value is 98%. I can explain 98% of the variance in this data using this linear model. And my p-value is basically zero, so there is no chance I'm getting this just randomly. So this tells me that if I haven't looked at the data, I would run a linear regression, I would look at these uh, diagnostic values and think, okay, it's predicting my data perfectly. There's nothing wrong with this. So it went completely wrong just by adding one data point. And this happens in practice. I mean, my slightly real world example, maybe not so real world, but uh, this is a data set on data sharing scheme in Washington DC, where they basically, over two years, they recorded what was the weather, what was the temperature, what was the day of the week, if it was holiday or not, uh, and how many people borrowed a bike. And humidity, wind, etc. And this is the number of people borrowing a bike that day. So if I run a fairly standard linear regression on this, uh, 
this whole stuff, I don't want to really go into details, but it tells me which things are important for the model. And you can see that my R squared is 80%, so I can predict 80% of the variance, so it's doing fairly well in modeling the data, and my p-value is almost zero. So I'm not getting these results by chance. So this model is fairly reasonable. And let's say I some, someone joins my team and says, well, this value looks weird, or there is one day missing, so let's edit and let's put the temperature to 100, because it's definitely in Fahrenheit, because this is a US data set. So we edit one data point, and let's run it again. And suddenly my R squared is 73, so my performance dropped by 7%, although the p-value is still almost zero. So just by adding one data point, uh, the, re the secret is that uh, the data are not in Fahrenheit, the temperatures were normalized into a zero one interval. But without looking at the data, you have no idea. And you can get good performance or bad performance, but you don't know what's happening behind. And you can basically ruin any linear regression just by adding one data point that's outside of the range. And if you don't check the data that are coming in, then you are definitely having this kind of problem. So this is, mostly just an illustration how brittle some of the algorithms are. Because linear regression is the very, very standard algorithm and it's very, very well understood, but people still just dump it on a data set without really thinking and looking. I think that's fine. And if you are a statistician, you are saying, oh no, well, everyone knows that you can't use linear regression on a data set like this. Because if you look at, uh, let's say, a Wikipedia article on linear regression, you have this huge section on assumptions. And it says that the data have to have weak exogeneity, homoscedasticity, uh, they assume lack of perfect multicollinearity, things like that. But I'm saying, like, who from normal people understands these terms? And you can't expect everyone that just wants to run a linear regression from uh, scikit-learn, let's say, to read everything like that and understand it. So I think it's basically a human-computer interaction problem because you can't uh, expect everyone to read all the small print, basically. And I think if the libraries told us that, okay, this is not a good data set to apply this algorithm to, uh, then I think everyone would be much happier. Let's look at another example of a decision tree. And this is an algorithm that underlines uh, all of the sort of most widely used algorithms like random forests. And it's a very traditional algorithm and it's traditionally used as a sort of cornerstone of interpretability in machine learning. So let me show you another demo. And let's use the hello world of decision trees, namely who survives on Titanic. It's basically a data set that has all the passengers who traveled on Titanic and you are supposed to predict if they survive or not. And in this demo I'll be using Python because well, we are data scientists, so let's, let's mix it up a bit. And this is how the data set looks. Who has seen the Titanic data set before? Well, a couple of people. So we basically have an information about a passenger name, uh, if they survived or not, what class they were traveling in, what was their sex, age, uh, how many siblings traveled with them, if their parents traveled with them, how much they paid, uh, if they had a cabin, etc. So let's run uh, first we need to make it into a matrix because, for example, the sex is uh, male or female, so I'm just encoding it as zero and one. So I ended up with a matrix. And let's just run a decision tree on this. And this is how the result looks. And it's very, very readable, interpretable. Basically, uh, in every node, you ask a question in this case, if uh, the numerical sex is smaller or equal than 0 
So this in my encoding is asking me, is it a male or a female? If it's zero, then it's male, so you go left. If it's one, it's a female, and you go right. So, and then you continue here. The next question is age. Is it smaller than 6.5? So if the person is age six, then you go left. Uh, otherwise, you go right, etc. And when you get to the bottom, it tells you if uh, that class of passengers survived or not. So basically, in my very simplistic model, uh, if you were a male, then the way to survive was to get into this leaf, meaning you had to be younger than seven and have uh, less than three siblings with you. So if you are from a large family, then sorry. So this is a simple model, but you can read it out. You can sort of understand it. You get basically rules out of it. Nice and simple, right? Well, let's look at some pathological example. So I'm creating a slightly weird data set where I'm creating a matrix where X and Y will be indices going between 0 and 100. And the values in the matrix will be that if the index X plus index Y is smaller than 100, then it's 0. If it's larger, then it's 1. Might be easier to plot it out. So, well, 0 is here. So this is my x-axis, this is my y-axis, and if x plus y is smaller than 100, I get green. If it's larger, I get 1. So it's a basically a matrix that I split diagonally. So let's see what happens if I run a decision tree on this. As I said, I'm just running a decision tree without looking at the documentation, etc. This is the decision tree I get. This is on a data set with two uh, input values, x and y. Uh, uh, let's zoom in onto the image. Hmm. Let's zoom even more. So it's basically asking, OK, is y smaller than 95.5? Is x smaller than 3.5, etc. So it's basically slicing x and y into very fine grid, and for every single cell in the grid, it's telling me the result. So that's why it ended up with a decision tree that looks like this. And now you might be thinking, well, this looks crazy because this is a decision tree for a two value data set. This is not interpretable. You look at this and you think, OK, this is some crazy, difficult problem because you end up with a huge tree like this. Well, that's because it's trying to slice it in a, in a, in a direction that's orthogonal to the dimensions in the data. And if uh, some of the values you are trying to predict are combinations of input values, then it simply doesn't work. And this does happen in practice. I mean, a, my colleague was playing with a Kaggle competition, and she kind me, uh, kindly let me use it here in the, in the talk. And she was playing with some task where people were supposed to predict uh, if people are going to give money to specific projects. Uh, like schools were supposed to. Um, uh, put out uh, projects they would like to get money for, and the donors would choose. So the task was to basically estimate uh, how the, uh, what types of projects will get money and which ones don't. And she played with it nicely, etc. Did all the parameter tuning and regularization, etc. And at the end, she wanted to make a point how interpretable the model is. So she plotted it. And she ended up with an image like this. And this is for something like 12 input variables. 
And you can see that it's a quite large and not very understandable uh, tree. So this happens in practice and people are always going on about how decision trees are interpretable and nice, but usually the data don't really follow the assumptions that the decision tree likes to assume. And if I go back to, say, Wikipedia uh, on decision trees, the first thing you would see there if you go to the Wikipedia site is that decision trees are simple to understand and interpret. They might be simple to understand, but interpret, I hope I convinced you that they are actually fairly hard to interpret if the data don't really conform to the form that the decision tree expects. So this is just me screaming on a big screen uh, and pointing at a completely non-interpretable decision tree that does a silly classification of a two-variable model. They are not interpretable. And let's go into another example. Let's go into deep learning, because that's the cool stuff, right? And for this demo, I'll be using F sharp, because why not? Let's mix it up. So for F sharp, the dependencies take the longest depending on my internet connection, because I'm of course using F-sharp data. And I'll be using the Microsoft Cognitive Services just because I have Azure credits lying around. Uh, if I used any of the APIs, if I used Google's APIs, etc., it would be exactly the same. I'm not trying to target Microsoft here. And what do these APIs do? Oh, this is just my helper function to query the API and display the result. And what I'll be doing is that I'll be sending it an image and it will tell me a description of the image and what tags should I assign to the image. So it's better to have an example. So let's get a description for this thing. Okay, and it's a close-up of a guitar. And the tags are music, guitar, musical instrument, string instrument, building material, I'm not sure, lumber and bass. But you can see here is the confidence, so it's fairly confident it's a musical instrument and it's a guitar and slightly less confident that this is building material. You probably don't want to build a house from guitars. And let's try it on another image. This is a monkey, and it's telling me it's a monkey sitting on a table. Well, not completely, but close enough. And it's a primate, animal, mammal, monkey. It's sitting, it's a macaque. It's an old world monkey, it's a new world monkey. If anyone knows the differences, please let me know. Uh, but you can see that it's fairly reasonable. Let's try it on another monkey just because I like monkeys. And this is a monkey sitting on a branch, uh, on a tree, and it's outdoor, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can see this works. Let's put it into production. Well, if you want to try to break some deep learning system, the first thing you try to do is give it something that the system has never, ever seen before. So let's try this. It's a bit disturbing. I call it a smeal, like a smiley seal, but it's not really. So the network tells me it's a close-up of a fish. And it, there is grass, it's outdoor, it's an animal, and there are eyes, fish, and face. It, it certainly doesn't see that it, this image is disturbing and what's weird about it. Uh, because, of course, these mathematical models don't uh, do surprises. It doesn't recognize that there are teeth, although they are fairly prominent, but overall I would say it's doing fairly well. 
because it's a close-up of something that looks basically like a fish with teeth. So I say, yeah, still doing fairly well. So let's try to modify some of the images I was showing you before. Let's give the monkey a guitar. Let's see. And it's a monkey holding a guitar. Mm, I'm impressed. Let's give the other monkey a guitar. And suddenly it's a dog looking at the camera. My theory is that no, these networks learn from their training data. And usually when it's indoors and uh, there is something furry and there's a guitar, it's probably a dog. I would expect a cat, but well. So it's trying to match a furry animal close to a guitar indoors, so it's guessing it's a dog. Well, let's do something completely different, like a guitar hanging in the air next to the monkey. And it's a monkey holding a dog. I have no idea what's happening here. And you can see that even in the tags, I mean, he, before, in the previous one, uh, uh, hmm, doesn't want to, uh, well, in the previous one, when the monkey was holding a guitar and was telling me it's a, a dog holding a guitar, it at least saw the guitar in the tags as well. It was telling me it's a musical instrument. Here, it doesn't see the guitar at all. And I'm not sure why it's telling me it's a monkey holding a dog. Well, so what do these networks actually see? Uh, my favorite example is from the blog uh, AI Weirdness from Janelle Shane. If you have never seen it, please do look it up because she plays with various crazy things with usually deep learning. Uh, and this is another example. This is a landscape. So let's try to see what's that. And I'm getting a herd of sheep grazing on a lush green hillside. Can anyone see a single sheep in there? The problem is that this is the sort of landscape where there are usually sheep, or where if you take a picture, there might be sheep. But yeah, it's the sort of landscape, because the network doesn't understand the actual concept of a sheep, or the actual concept of a guitar, or the actual concept of a monkey. It simply understands the pattern and how it sort of looks. And this looks like the sort of landscape where there might be sheep. And then I decided to do something else. So this is uh, a meeting room in our office uh, in the Turing Institute. So there's a man standing in a room uh, indoors. So there's a whiteboard. Actually, there is no whiteboard. There's a blackboard. Uh, there's office, etc. So fairly reasonable. So let's put the elephant in the room. <laughs> and it's a couple of people that are standing in a room with a whiteboard, there's furniture, zero elephants. Because the network just doesn't see the elephant at all, because that's not the sort of thing you see in an office. And if you see an actual elephant in a normal office, then maybe you are crazy. So the network is just basically closing its eyes and saying, OK, the elephant is not there, because it just doesn't appear in that sort of situation. And finally, let's give the elephant to the monkey. Let's test my theory again. You might see elephants in a rainforest, or surf, but it's a monkey sitting on a branch. Zero elephants. So it looks like the networks just don't like surreal images that don't really appear in reality. So let's try some standard surreal images. So this is from René Magritte. Uh, this painting is called Son of Man. And the neural network says it's a man wearing a suit and a hat. If you look at it yourself, the first thing that catches your eyes is probably the apple that's sort of hanging there in front of the face. Well, the network just doesn't see that. 
It's just a man wearing a suit and a hat and zero apples. And finally, this is not a pipe, so what is it? Another painting from René Magritte. So, and this is a close-up of a mug. <laughs> so it seems that neural networks don't really do serial images. So they just basically close their eyes and don't see things that don't fit into the image. Uh, well, you might have seen all these articles about these fancy methods to confuse uh, deep learning systems and surveillance, etc. Like here, uh, printing a colorful printout that you put around your neck and then uh, the surveillance cameras don't see you. This is actually fairly hard to do because usually you need to have some kind of access to the system or know the actual specific algorithm that they are using to be able to come up with something like this. But you can see that it's fairly easy to just confuse the system by giving it something that it's not expecting. So maybe if we all wore animal masks, then surveillance systems wouldn't work. I haven't tested that. Uh, that's because they really don't have any concept of the actual things in the image or entities. This is another example. This is from Reddit, uh, where this guy, apparently if you have an Android phone and you are using some Google app, uh, when you take a couple of pictures in the same area, it will offer you to create a panorama automatically. So this user clicked yes and <laughs> ended up as a mountain. Because literally the network, we are like to humanize uh, artificial intelligence, but it doesn't have any concept of the entities in the image. And the thing is, it's just learning patterns from uh, the training set. And this is a research done last year, I think, uh, in Facebook actually, where they took all of these uh, APIs uh, cognitive services, uh, Amazon, Google, uh, IBM Watson, Clarify, etc. And they gave it pictures from like, sort of our normal world and from developing countries. So this is an example of a soap from Nepal and a soap from US, UK, I don't know, uh, UK actually. So. The thing is, the soap from the UK was classified as uh, toilet sink, uh, soap, etc. The soap from Nepal was, across all these APIs, classified as food. Because it was just not in the training set, and it's colorful, and it's on a sort of plate, so it's probably food. And that's quite sad. That means the training sets were fairly biased towards uh, places where people take most pictures which means uh, rich countries. And the problem of biased training sets and biased assumptions, et cetera, uh, is quite common. Like this is an example from November where uh, it came to court that the self-driving Uber car in a crash didn't see uh, a woman that was crossing the street because it wasn't desi designed to see people who are crossing away from uh, pedestrian crossings. So it was basically trying to classify a person crossing the street, and it was switching classifications because it couldn't really pinpoint it that, yes, this is a person actually crossing, because it just wasn't designed to do that. And this is getting scary because people are using it in medicine and medical applications. Uh, I just wanted to put this paper in here because this is a research done actually uh, one and a half year ago where they were looking at how transferable are models trained in one hospital to another hospital. And they tried to train a neural network to classify pneumonia. And it was performing fairly well, everything was fine. So they transferred it to another hospital and found that it was completely terrible. And the reason is that uh, for some of the cases, uh, you can see that there is a picture with a red light, etc. Because in a neural network, you can see where it's looking when it's making a classification. 
So this network was looking at the shoulder. That's not where you get pneumonia, is it? I'm not a uh, doctor, but I'm fairly certain you are not supposed to be looking at the shoulder. And the neural network was looking at the shoulder because uh, for some of the patients that were too sick to go to a normal x-ray, uh, they got a mobile x-ray wheeled to their uh, bed, and then they got a metal tag placed on their shoulder to sort of uh, basically um, calibrate the machine. So that means if the patient is sick enough that they can't even go to the x-ray, then they are more likely to have pneumonia regardless of the actual x-ray results. So the neural network basically zoomed in on this easy to identify feature and didn't really learn to classify pneumonia. So these are the sort of things that are fairly hard to spot, but people quite often don't focus on them. If you went to the .NET Rocks uh, live yesterday discussion, I was mentioning this research where they were looking at classifying melanoma or basically skin lesions uh, from photos. And this is an application that's certified for medical use in the European Union. So this is getting properly scary. Uh, basically you give it a picture of a lesion, of a skin mark, and it says it's a benign or it's malignant. So these researchers did one simple modification. They added violet surgical marks around a benign lesion. And that's what surgeons do before extracting something. Took pictures and 100% of the time it was classified as malignant. Because anytime this appeared in the training set, it was malignant because it was targeted for surgical extraction. And they also did one additional thing. They uh, took the pictures of the skin marks and zoomed in on them. So they appeared larger. And when they appeared larger, again, 100% of the time, they were classified as malignant, even though they were benign, just because they changed the scale of the image. And this is classified for medical use. And this is uh, properly scary because it's not actually looking for some of the cases at the lesions, it's looking at various other indicators that might be sort of correlated with lesions, like the surgical marks. So I hope you are scared enough, because I am. <laughs> but the problem is really with the data, because it's not the models. The models literally do what we tell them. They learn the mapping from the data we give them to the target classes that we give them, benign, malignant, uh, et cetera, pneumonia, no pneumonia. But the data are biased, because if there is some simpler rule that can be learned from the data, the system will learn it. Like, okay, if there's something violet, then it's definitely malignant. And we quite often don't really look at the data because it's too tempting to just take the data, stick them into a model and do something with it. My favorite example of this from sort of a developer uh, world is a couple of years ago, actually three years ago almost, uh, there was this article that uh, got picked up by a lot of news uh, outlets, etc. cetera. Uh, developers who use spaces make more money than those who use tabs. Uh, it got picked up by BBC. Uh, programmers who use spaces are paid more. I'm not sure what the quotation marks mean here. Uh, and it was a fairly consistent effect across all experience levels. In this plot, basically, the x-axis is number of years someone coded as part of their job, and on the y-axis is their median salary. And in the red are people who use spaces, and the rest are people who use tabs or both. So it holds across all experience levels, and it's a, it's a very weird effect. I have a blog post on this, so if you are interested in why I think this is happening, go to my blog. Uh, but the first thing I did when I, well, First, I should say that this uh, data comes from uh, the Stack Overflow developer survey. Uh, so it's people self-reporting. And the Stack Overflow data team made the data available so anyone can download it and look at it themselves. So I did just that. 
because that's a very weird thing uh, with the tabs and spaces. So let's look at it, why is that happening? So the first thing I did uh, was that I plotted the salary distribution. This is a histogram showing salary distribution across the whole data set. All values are in US dollars. And I was looking at this and thinking there is something weird going on. Do you see the spike around zero? That's weird because that's developers who are annually paid basically nothing. So I zoomed in on that and plotted a bar chart of countries where developers report that their annual salary is lower than $3,000. That's like $250 a month. That's not much if you are a developer. So the first one is India. So India is not a particularly rich country, so maybe. But the second one is Poland. Is there anyone from Poland here? No. But then uh, among these countries, there is also Germany. And Germany definitely is not a poor country where developers would be paid $250 per month. So what is happening here? Well, this is the standard salary distribution from countries where I didn't suspect anything weird happening. So I plotted the UK, France, and India. And you can see that it's a nice sort of one uh, mode, one bump distribution. And then I'm originally from the Czech Republic, so I have some domain knowledge. So I plotted uh, salary distribution in Central and Eastern Europe. And you can see that these shapes look very different. I go back, this is like a distribution with one bump. This is Central and Eastern Europe. So Germany is the blue one, so the bump around zero is small, the main one is larger. Then Poland, they are both about equal. And actually in Russia, most developers report a very, very weirdly low salary. So does anyone have a guess what's happening there? I see some people smiling. Well, the thing is people reported their monthly salary instead of their annual salary. Because of course I used, for example, Poland as an example. Well, this was the question that uh, was asked in the survey. What is your current annual salary underlined in bold uh, please enter a whole number, blah, blah, blah. Wow. So I looked at Poland. I ran some mixture model. I looked at the mean of the lower bump compared to the mean of the lar larger bump. And of course, it was roughly one twelfth of the larger one. So if you just multiply that, you get a normal distribution again. So the problem was that in some countries, people just, well, my domain knowledge was that in Czech Republic, when you are talking about your salary, you never, ever, ever talk about your annual salary. You always talk about your monthly salary. Because that's just the way it's discussed uh, when you are, uh, I don't know, applying for a job, when you are looking at job listings. It always, always lists monthly salary. So why would people think even about annual salary if they never did that? So they see a question about salary, so they put in the most straightforward thing, which is their monthly salary. And uh, I validated it in Poland. It's exactly the same thing. I asked my Polish friends. In Germany, it's also the same thing, but probably Germans probably read a bit more carefully. Uh, so turns out part of the data was just wrong because the Stack Overflow data team basically just took it at face value because that's what people reported. Uh, I highlighted it to them and to their credit, they changed the format of uh, the question in the developer survey. So they, now they ask you for a number and then you have to pick if it's a monthly salary or a weekly salary or an annual salary, etc. But this data, I came across this uh, error in the data basically by chance, by looking at the data and thinking, okay, there is something wrong going on. And uh, they didn't and other people didn't. 
So there might be other things going completely wrong in there as well. Uh, and the thing is, everyone wants to do the cool machine learning thing where you run the cool deep learning or the cool uh, newest algorithm. Uh, but most of the work in data science is actually looking at the data. And uh, the thing is, any result you get is very much dependent on the data set you have. I wanted to highlight that with a uh, fun research done in, the, uh, in MIT, in Media Lab, where they created Norman, the first psychopath AI. Uh, and what they did, they basically gave it ink blots and trained it uh, using the darkest corners of Reddit uh, to describe the ink blot. <laughs> So this is a normal standard AI saying, okay, this is black and white photo of a small bird. This is Norman. Man gets pulled into a dough machine. Uh, another example, a person is holding an umbrella in the air. Nice, innocuous. A man is shot to death in front of his screaming wife. So this is just highlighting that any machine learning is very much dependent on the data set that you give it. And sometimes it's fairly hard to spot the mistakes like in the Stack Overflow data set because no one was specifically checking if every sort of question that people answered is reported correctly. And uh, sometimes it's fairly obvious uh, like in the in the research where they were classifying the soap, just because that's not a very well represented thing in the data sets that we have, because all these uh, AIs uh, use images that are available online for training. So if you have less images, it's not going to recognize it that well. But I think it's very important to keep this in mind if you are doing any machine learning, if you are being subjected to any machine learning, any AI, is that it still very much depends on the data set it's trained on. So this talk was supposed to be about black box AI, but I think it's more about black box data because that's the thing that people don't examine that closely. They just run a machine learning algorithm on it and expect miracles or expect results. And quite often you get them, but the data are biased in some way. Uh, so, my suggestion is that if you are ever using machine learning or if you are working with someone doing machine learning and if you get any data from anywhere, do ask questions. Like how were the data collected, uh, what pre-processing was done, if there are any outliers, because outliers can mess up very simple models even. What are the biases? And if you think there are no biases in the data, then you just haven't discovered the biases. Uh, there are techniques to de-bias a data set, but you have to be aware of what specific biases you want to remove. So in, with biases, it's more sort of a question if you are okay with the biases that are in the data or you want to spend quite a lot of time fixing that. Uh, are the real world data different from your training data? And uh, that's mostly a question of my serialistic images because those were things that are not appearing in real world, so the models are not trained to see them. And is the model a right one for the data? So if you want a interpretable model, maybe you should reconsider if you are using something like a decision tree. Uh, if you have a data set with outliers, you shouldn't use linear regression, etc. And lastly, is your model doing what you really think it's doing? Because if you get a reasonable result at the end, numbers that look reasonable, usually people don't look deeper because that's what they expect to get, so everything is fine. But quite often the model zooms in on something that you don't really want to uh, want it to zoom in if it really wants to understand the data. So for me, the data science is like an iceberg where the top of the iceberg is doing the cool machine learning just doing like one-liner from scikit-learn, let's say. That's the cool stuff, that's all the Coursera courses on, etc. But the bottom of the iceberg is actually all the data and all the data pre-processing and all the data cleaning, etc. Because that's not sexy, it's not automated, and 
It requires quite a lot of domain knowledge. It requires quite a lot of work. So if you are considering doing some machine learning, that's unfortunately the truth if you are not dealing with some nice clean data set, which it never is in practice. So I'm not actually afraid of the AI taking over and general artificial intelligence. I'm mostly afraid of people using the algorithms we have right now uh, in a wrong way, using biased data, using them to make decisions about things they are not supposed to make decisions on. Uh, so as I said, it was mostly about not black box AI, but black box data, because if you don't look at the data, you get the wrong results. Even a simple outlier can mess up linear regression. Uh, decision trees that are thought to be sort of very understandable and simple model, not really. And deep learning, it's very, 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 very much dependent on the training data set you use. And I was showing you an example with uh, Azure Cognitive Services. It's the same with any of the services that are out there or any uh, machine learning that you train yourself because it has limited data and it doesn't have any concepts of the things that are actually in a data set. So if you are using anything like this in practice or in production, just be careful and examine the biases and examine the faults and you have to be okay with them. Thank you.